If you're in the building, you can stand. If you're at home, you can stand too. Or sit. God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone before time began, you are on your throne, you are God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone, you're the only God whose power You're the only God whose name and praise will never end. You're the only God who's worthy of everything we can give. You are God, and that's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone, you're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You are God alone, from before time began, you are on your throne, you are God alone. Before time began, you are on your throne, you are God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone, you are God alone. A few weeks ago, Kellis shared, I don't remember what week it was, but man, he said something that knocked my socks off. He was talking about Philippians 4, 6, is that right? In all things, no, don't be anxious about anything, but in all things with thanksgiving and give thanks. Give, uh, bring your petitions to, to Christ. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's the revised Kelvin version. Um, but the point he made that was so powerful was when we feel anxious about a thing, give thanks for all things. And that was like, how many times have I heard that verse? 
And then he says that, and it just like blows me away because so many times, and, I, and I'm kind of learning this, is when we're like stressed, and, and I, you know, the cat's out of the bag. I get anxious. I worry. And, and I tend to want to think about that thing, and I tend to want to pray about that thing and that, that thing only. And sometimes that just feeds the anxiety. And that verse, and oh man, it was so powerful to hear that what I need to be doing if I'm anxious about a thing is to be thankful about all things and to pray about all things and take my focus off that. And I, I love this next song. I think if there is a song of the year, this is it. Um, and, and not just because, you know, it talks about the world being broken and creation groaning, but what it does is it, it, it shifts that. And it says, but he is, he is. It doesn't focus on the solution to those problems. It focuses on the God who has a solution. And he is, and, and uh, yeah, I, I, I got to remember that. I've got to, you know, just don't be anxious about a thing and give thanks for all things. So let's sing, um, Is He Worthy? Do you feel the world is broken? shadows deepen we do do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of it? Does a father truly love us? He does. Does a spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? made us a kingdom and priest to God 
to reign with the sun. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley. It has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever. The chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this 
Thank you, Father, that you choose to live through us. And we thank you for the privilege of following you, God. We just ask that you uh, be with us in this place today, God, and open our ears and our hearts to you. And it's in Christ's name. Amen. chapter 2, verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and well filled, and yet you do not give them what's necessary for the body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may wait, may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and it, as a result of works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers? And sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Gang, good morning, guys. I'm excited to go through this. I, uh, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but one thing that I have always wanted to do is skydive. Has anybody ever been skydiving? You guys been skydiving? Has anyone in here ever been skydiving? I mean, Callie's probably laughing right now because she knows how afraid of heights I am. Uh, I, and I, so I'll be honest, I don't think I could actually go through with it. But, there, but if you think about it, there's a lot of faith connected with skydiving. Let me just again think about it. You have to trust your, your instructor, and you probably don't even know this guy or, 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 or lady. You really have to trust the person who packed your parachute. Right? You really got to trust them. And then you go up in the airplane. You got to trust the pilot. And you probably don't know that guy. And then, so all this stuff, you, you make one mistake at whatever 4,000 feet or whatever it is, you're dead. 
You make them one mistake. If any of those people who you don't know make a mistake, you're dead. So uh, you could say that you, you, know, you trust these people, but really at that moment, that moment of truth is when, when you're up there at 4,000 feet and the instructor hits the latch. You imagine the door popping open. You're looking down <laughs> like, whoa. At that moment, you can say you trust the instructors. You can say you can trust that you trust the person who packed your parachute. You can say you trust the pilot. But if you're not willing to jump, everything up to then has just been just been talk. If you're, that's the moment, if you're, at that moment, you're not willing to jump. It's just empty talk. Everything up to that moment has just been talk. And that's, that's the moment of truth. Truth always, or true faith, always demonstrates itself in action. That's what I want to talk about this morning. And I really, I want, I want to pose the question for everybody. Is it possible that someone can believe the historical facts of or, or the message of Christmas? I mean, everything about the virgin birth and the wise men and the shepherds. Is it possible someone can believe all the details of Christmas? That someone could even believe all the historical facts, all this, the things surrounding Easter, again, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. Is it possible for someone to believe in all these things and yet not genuinely, not truly be saved. That's what I want to talk about this morning. So, guys, if you have your Bible, we're going to go back to James chapter 2. Chris just read through it. So the question is, what is the nature of saving faith? Is it possible that you can believe in Christmas, you can believe in Easter, and not genuinely be saved? In James chapter 1, kind of want to go back and, and, and think about it for a minute. He's been talking about... Uh, someone who is a, a doer of the word, and he's talking about someone who is just a mere hearer of the word. So uh, he's contrasting someone who hears but, uh, and with someone who does. And, and, and he's really going to start unpacking that and showing us what does it mean? What's the difference between just a hearer and a doer? So that's what he's talking about. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works. Can faith save him? So what use is it if someone says they have faith, but in their life, there's no works? It doesn't support that. Now, the verb tense of this is actually someone who continues to say they have faith, but they continue to not demonstrate it by works. They're continually demonstrating no works. So the question is not, can faith save? I mean, we, we, we settle that in Galatians. Look at the text. The question is, can that faith save? That's a big difference. That's the real discussion. The, the discussion this morning is about what is the nature of saving faith? There's different levels. There's different qualities of faith. And we all say we have faith. I mean, you're sitting in a chair. You have faith that that chair supports your weight because you didn't test it. You probably just sat right down. You have faith. But what is the quality of faith that actually saves you? So that what kind of faith saves? So just keep that in mind as we go as we go along. Uh, so James is going to answer the question and he's using an illustration. So I was thinking about doing like an interpretive kind of dance. I might kind of you know use my my motions or say so if a brother or sister is without clothing and they're in need of of, <laughs> I can't go any further than that. I'll just lose my mind. So if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and then one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you don't give them what is necessary for their body, what use is it? So let's imagine, let, let's just bring it to Kentucky. Let's imagine it's January, late January. That's when it gets cold here, right? <laughs> I've only been here for 10 years. That's when it's cold. And you live out in the county. And there's this huge freak snowstorm, a whole, you know, whopping three inches of snow. I mean, the whole county is shut down. Nobody is home. And you're, and you're home in, in the middle of this snowstorm, and you're counting all your loaves of bread and all your gallons of milk because you're a hoarder, and you saw it coming. And you're there, but and you happen to be in the middle of a movie, right? And you're just in, in the middle of it, and then all of a sudden you hear the doorbell ring. And you're like, who in the world is out? So you go, you pause the movie, you go to the door, and you see a single mother with two small children. And something happened. Their car went in the ditch. 
they're, they're, they're stuck. There's no cell phone. It took all that they could to come to your door. I mean, they're not dressed for weather. They're hungry. All of this, and they're, and they're asking for help. Well, of course, you're a little irritated. You're in the middle of the movie, but you, you, you with all your, your maturity in Christ, resolve that. It's just a movie. Yes, I would be happy to help. And so you kind of stand back in this pious King James language and you say, depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled. And then you slam the door and get back to your movie. What use is that? That's in essence is what James is saying. That's just empty talk. You're not helping them. Your faith, has, faith that has no works is like that. So verse 17 says, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Again, this discussion is not about whether or not faith saves. We know we're saved by faith and faith alone. But it is about the nature, it's about the quality of faith. And the argument James is making is says, saving faith, is, it, it has such a quality that it will always manifest itself in action. So the, faith that saves will have action. There's going to be works that support it. One thing that you can say, you can say you trust the instructors, you trust the parachute. But if you're unwilling to jump out of the plane, that faith is useless. That faith is dead. That faith accomplishes nothing. So verse 18 goes on, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So James, he's kind of like creating this scenario. So he's imagining someone's there. They're objecting maybe to what he's saying. And so he's just kind of imagining someone's disagreeing to that. So what he says, someone says, he kinda, he's kind of putting this in, in, in this imaginary person's mouth, the mouth of the objector. So, we, so what he wants the objector to, uh, us to imagine the objector saying, hey, some people have faith, but some people have works. And then James kind of reengages and he says, okay, well, show me your faith without the works. It's very interesting to think about. A lot of people say they have faith. Okay, well, show me your faith and, and show me it without the works. How do you show someone that you have faith without works? I mean, obviously, the conclusion is you can't. Someone can't, I mean, our children, you can't say they have faith and then we never see any works in their life. You can't. How can you show that you have faith without works? You can't. And so the faith that is you, that, 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 that faith is useless. So he says that faith is dead. James says, I will show you my faith by my works. So he's, he's demonstrating that true saving faith as works. Verse 19 says, it's kind of a, a shock factor to it. So that, that's really, really what he's trying to say. He's not to create a lot of like new theology or new doctrine, but we, we just, just take it. He's going for shock factor. So he says, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons believe, and they shudder, or they, or they tremble, your, your version may say. So that phrase, you believe that God is one, very, very familiar to the Hebrew people. Remember, he's writing to a bunch of Jews that were just dispersed all throughout. They, they started in Jerusalem. He was probably their pastor while they were in Jerusalem, and then the persecution came, and they just spread out. And so he's writing a letter to dispersed Jews. And then they would have been familiar with this. This is just a phrase that again, would come, came up in the Jewish. We call it the, the, the Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's their creed. It's something that they would teach their children, that they would believe in and say, and essentially that their God is one God. That doesn't seem that radical to us, you know, obviously, in the United States. I mean, we're familiar with this. We've grown up in this, knowing in the Christian, Christian, in the Christian faith, there's one God, three in one. But in the, in the ancient times, virtually all the other religions were polytheistic. They had lots of gods. They would, the, this God and that God. And so one of the things that made the Hebrews and their belief system unique is that they had one God. That was their creed. It was their declaration. Our God is one. And so it's very significant. And James is saying, you understand that. You believe the creed. You, you, you accept that. You've been taught that from a child. You do well. But you need to understand even the demons believe that. Even the demons believe that, obviously implying that the demons 
don't have saving faith. That's the implication. They don't have saving faith, and they believe what you believe. So it is fair to say that demons believe the historical facts of Christmas. They believe them. In fact, if you were to just talk about and share all the details of, of, of Christmas and the demons would say, yeah, yeah, I know, I get it, I, I believe. And then so you're explaining, you know, it's like you're trying to save a demon or something, you know, and you're sharing all the details of, of Easter and you're just walking through the details, believing in, in Jesus as uh, dead, his death and his burial and his resurrection. The demon would be like, yeah, I get it. They really do get it. In fact, he goes on to say they get it so much, they actually get it appropriately, they actually shudder. They actually tremble at the reality of this. And so they get it, they know it's true, true to the, to the degree that it makes them shudder. So just hear this. Everybody, hear this. It's not enough to just give mental assent to the historical facts of the gospel. Just giving mental assent to the historical facts of the gospel, that is equivalent to demonic faith. That's what you have. You have a demonic faith if you only give mental assent. Verse 20 says, But are you willing to recognize, O foolish fellow? So that, that, that's a very strong, very derogatory term. It means this empty, shallow person. V very strong statement. Are you willing to recognize, you shallow fool, that faith without works is useless? Faith without works is useless. I'm going to make sure you guys hear this. Can everybody say after me, faith without works is useless. So, so is it possible to have faith alone, faith that never manifests itself in fruit or in works? Is that saving faith? And the answer is obviously no, it's not. Same level of faith. If you guys know John Calvin, he's an old uh, Reformed theologian for got pros and cons one of the things that he said we are saved by faith alone but the faith that saves is not alone he got it he was spot on in other words the quality of saving faith the quality of, of the faith that, that you have to have to truly be saved it will be such that it will make itself manifest it will produce works in your life it will always manifest itself in work. It will always manifest itself in fruit, in a demonstration. So it's one thing to say, I believe all these things. And a lot of people are willing. I mean, I'm sharing the gospel with complete strangers sometimes. They're like, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. And I'm like, well, how come your life doesn't show that you get it? Where are the works? Where's the demonstration of it? Well, it's just not really for me. I hear it all the time. So it gives one thing that, to say that you believe all these things, but if you're unwilling to jump out of the plane uh, in, in relation, you know, to, to the, the metaphor and the, the story I was giving, if you're willing, unwilling to jump out of the plane, then your faith is dead. It's youth, useless. There has to be action connected to it. One of the ways to, to process this, I think this is sobering, is to realize that you can, again, you can believe in totality the story of Christmas. You can believe in totality the story of Easter. And then so, someone could even probably ask you the question, if, if you were to die tonight and stand before God, what would you say? And you might even be able to get the answer correct. I mean, if I, if I were to give you a, a, a quiz, you could get every answer right. That doesn't mean you have saving faith. It's way beyond that. That's the danger of a question like this. When we, when we try and lead people to see if they have given mental assent. Because we sometimes can pat them on the back and make, give them this false security when there's no works. There's no, there's, no act, there's no manifestation of true faith and their faith that we are applauding them for or whatever it is, is actually a, a, a dead faith. So James is saying you're not in you're not in, you're not safe unless there's evidence in your life that you truly have faith. It's a very sobering discussion. And so he gives us two little illustrations. I think that would be re very relevant to the Jewish culture. We're going to try and pick apart and, and glean as much as we can. So verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? So again, it's really important to take these verses in context. 
I know a lot of people are going to take this and spin it, and then it actually goes so far into legalism. Remember, we're saved by faith, but what's the quality of faith? That's our, that's our, our aim. So don't pull these out of context. The word justified is never referencing or, or the means of salvation. Let me say that. It's always a reference to the declaration or a result of salvation. The discussion that Paul is, is having in Romans is like, can you be saved by works? And so Paul is, is debating this belief uh, that you can be saved on the basis of works of the law. You guys remember this is, this is deeper, kind of maybe a little bit of a, uh, a side conversation just to, to support this so you can follow. But his argument in, in Romans is like, you are saved by faith, not by works. He's very clear about that. And James would agree with that, 100%. But James is adding to it. He's saying the faith that saves you is a faith that works. It's not dead. Dead faith can't save you. It, it, it's not useless. The faith that saves you will manifest itself in works, in fruit, and in evidence. And so when the text is talking about Abraham being justified, that is, he's being declared, like, officially and publicly declared righteous, when he offered up Isaac, it's tying back to a verse that James is going to talk about in just a second. He's referencing Genesis 15, verse 6. Now, everybody would agree that the moment of salvation for Abraham, as the Old, text, the Old Testament text says, Abraham believed, and it was credited. It was, it was given to him. He was reckoned to be righteous. The verb tense means he believes, he believed, and at that moment, he was declared righteous. So if James is correct in saying that saving faith always manifests itself in works, then we should be able to look at the life of Abraham and we should see works that supported his belief. Remember, it says he believed and he was reckoned righteous. So he had faith. And that was a saving faith. So we should see works in his life based on what James is telling us. Can I get it right on? Are you following me there? Okay. So 30 years later, Abraham is willing to offer his son, Isaac. What James is saying in that in doing so, in doing so, it is validating the claim that Abraham believed. It was 30 years later, and there might have been lots of other things, but we're talking about that action. That action was not what, valid, well, not what I guess, credited him righteous, the offering of the son, but it was that action that validated his belief 30 years prior. So it's not, a, it's not a contradiction. He's showing the evidence of the belief Abraham was already declared to have had. It was a, he was publicly declaring him as righteous. He truly had saving faith. Verse 22 goes on. Another illustration. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. So it was completed. It was manifested. It was validated for all to see. So he's essentially he's going back on a statement, and he's saying, I will show you my faith by my works. So that's the nature of his argument. He was declared that Abraham had saving faith in 15, and 30 years later he gave overwhelming evidence. Verse 23, he starts quoting the, that scripture that I was talking about. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So the scripture was fulfilled. Sometimes, I guess we, we could translate that. I've, I've used this wording already this morning. Uh, he was validated. Scripture was validated. It was he was already declared to be righteous. And then th th this happened, and he gave overwhelming evidence that the claim 30 years prior was accurate. I think we get it. Let's move on. Verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Again, if you pull that out of context, you're going to get so much legalism. You're going to get so much. I, uh, just, it's going it's to ruin everything. It's going to spiral out of control. But track the context. It's not a discussion about whether or not save or faith saves. It's about what, what is the quality of faith. And that's, that, that, again, that's what Romans is all about. This is discussion about the quality of faith. 
The idea, again, is justif- justification is to be declared righteous. So when we act on our faith, we manifest our faith. When we give evidence of faith, when we, we have works and we, and we have fruit in our lives, we are publicly declaring and showing and validating what we claim to be as Christians. We're giving evidence to it. I just wonder, like, like I've heard this before. This is not in my notes, Aslan, but just when we go out in life, wherever life takes you, do your work support your claim? You claim to be a Christian, but does your life support it? I mean, we ask this question sometimes, like if you were to be on trial for being a Christian, and all we could do is look at your life and see the works, see the patience, see the, the serving, see the, 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 the all whatever. There's all sorts of works and fruit. But if we were to put you on trial, would you be convicted? I hope so. So don't pull this out of context. Verse 25, in the same was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? I feel bad for Rahab, kind of. I mean, she, she, a wonderful history and a wonderful part, being a part of Jesus' lineage, you know, his genealogy. But she never gets to drop the title. She never gets to drop it. Everywhere you look, it's always Rahab the harlot. So she's actually, this is a very different illustration. Abraham was the pillar of faith. Rahab, quite scandalous. In in an ancient world, in a place like Jericho, much of her business would have come through travelers. Travelers who were coming in, travelers who were were just stay there for a little while, and and that's where her business would come. But it's very likely that some Hebrew travelers actually came through. And they were probably talking about this Hebrew God and all, this, all these things that this Hebrew God has done for his people. And so she probably, you know, finds out now that the armies of this Hebrew God are just outside. They're preparing to attack the city. And so the evidence that she believes, that she believed, was that she was willing to take them in and help them escape. She was willing to hide them, these spies, and help them escape. But there was probably never a discussion, sitting down over dinner, hey, Rahab, have you ever thought about this? If you were to die tonight, would would you go to heaven or hell? I doubt they had that conversation. I doubt they had that. The only thing we know is that she took the spies in. They, she kept them safe. She snuck them out. And when the city was destroyed, she was rescued. In other words, th- th- this makes a great illustration. It was by her works. It wasn't by some intellectual mental ascent questionnaire that she got all the answers right. It was evidence in her life that she really believed. In fact, if Jericho had won the battle... And they found out that she had helped the spies. She would have been executed. That's what was on the line. She would have been killed and she knew that. She made her choice. And that's what landed her in Hebrews chapter 11, in this faith hall of fame. James is making the argument, if you really believe, it goes way beyond talk. It goes way beyond raising your hand, saying, "Uh uh-huh, at the right times. Or maybe even it goes way beyond saying a prayer. It has to be action. There has to be evidence in your life of a change. Verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So my body without the spirit is dead. It's lifeless. It can't do anything. It just falls. So so faith without works is dead. It's actually faith without works is a demonic faith. It accomplishes absolutely nothing. There's the the sobering sobering reality of the fact that that, that there there, there can be a difference between someone who is an atheist or very little difference between someone who is an atheist and someone who actually says, I believe in Christmas, I believe in Easter. There can actually be very little difference between those two people. Someone who has never really submitted to the truth. Someone who has never really surrendered to Jesus, allowing him to be the Savior and Lord of their life. They just give intellectual assent, but they're really not that much different to someone who just is willing to say, I don't believe in God. 
Whatever faith is, it's just talk without works. It's dead, it's useless, it has no saving effect. The difference between demonic faith, the difference between someone who, who just gives intellectual assent to the details, and, and someone who experiences true saving faith, is the willingness to surrender to whatever God wants, to, to surrender to what God says. That's the difference. I mean, you see plenty of people, be, again, who say, uh-huh, yeah, I believe this. Yeah, okay, I, I'm willing to accept that. All right, now take up your cross and follow Jesus. No, I'm not quite ready for that. I'm not quite ready to live my life for him. That's a demonic faith. It doesn't save. So it's not enough that, yes, I believe that happened, but you have to recognize that was for you. All that Jesus did on the cross was for you. You needed that. And you surrender your life to that truth. In brokenness, brokenness and in humility, you acknowledge you need a Savior. And I think, that, I think that's, that's the key. I think a lot of times people are willing to accept this, that the, these facts, these historical things, as, as maybe plausible, and, and they're willing to say, yeah, I believe in that. But when it comes down to, are you willing to surrender your life? Are you willing to you know, acknowledge that you need a Savior? That you're in trouble without Him? That's when people really rise up. They're not willing to submit to that. And again, we see that in Galatians and even earlier in James. There's this desire in us to be our own God. There's this deep down desire in us to fix our own problems. So if that you still have that and you're still walking in that deep down demonic desire, no matter what you say, you, you're, not in, you're, not, you're not cool. You're not good. You need to be careful. So... My life, it was saving faith. My life then begins to be lived out as a new creation. I start having new desires. I start, you know, again, submitting to the Lord. I have a, a desire for Him. Again, like, like we talk about in the New Testament, He becomes this treasure in my life that I seek after. There's a change in my desires. There's a change in my wants. How many people do you think out there are convinced because they came forward in a service because they repeated a prayer because someone said, just say these words and get your ticket to heaven, they think they're true believers. When did that become enough? Just raise your hand, sign on the dotted line. Unfortunately, so many people in, in churches all around the world are, 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 are settling for this, and we call it easy, easy believism. You just believe these things and you're good. James is like, no, I'm sorry. That, that is a lie. Don't buy the lie. There has to be works. You ask them questions on a quiz. They get all the right answers. But it doesn't mean they've really surrendered their life to the truth of the message and the reality of God's kingdom and, and him being the king. So this text is one that we use to, I would say, to examine our hearts. And it's good. It's really good. No matter how long you've been in church, how long, how long you, you, you've been saved, it's good to examine your own heart. Some of you are, right now are thinking, though, I wish Harry was here. Man, Harry needs to hear this. That's the danger of a, of a message like this, right? You hear this, and you start inspecting other people's life. Man, I don't see... I don't see a lot of fruit in that person's life. I really wish they'd hear this. In fact, maybe you've already clicked on the link and you tagged somebody or you shared it. Guys, you can't do that. Nobody knows. Only God knows. This is a text that we use to examine our heart. There are several texts like this in the New Testament, but all of them are for the same purpose. It's for each of us to examine our own lives. All right? You're not the kingdom's fruit inspector. God hasn't given you that title. You know, we, the, the, the county has a health inspector. Corey comes around regularly. It's his job to check on other people. The, the, there, the, that position doesn't really exist in, in, in the kingdom. You know, if it makes itself absolutely clear, you can share a loving concern. But really, this is for you to inspect your own heart. Only we really know what's in there. Only we can really answer the question, do, do, do I really believe this? Is there evidence of works in my life? I mean, because a lot of us, let's be honest, we're good at faking it. We're good at putting on the show to those around us. So if there was another inspector, we could probably pass. 
We could probably pass the test if someone else was inspecting us because we know how to walk the part. We know how to, we know how to speak the part. But ask yourself, is there evidence of works in my life? Is there some way in which faith is manifested in my life? Is there a fruit that is flowing out of my faith? Guys, if you can sin as a way of life and it doesn't bother you, you have reason to be concerned. If you really don't have much of a heart or a desire for things of God, if you're not really passionate about spending time with Jesus, and he's just someone that you spend a few moments with maybe once a week, you have reason to be concerned. But each of us need to look deep inside of ourselves. What is the evidence that I believe this? For those of you like, like me, I mean, I was raised in a Christian home. And, and it's really easy to think, if you're raised in a Christian home, and then you know the right answers, it's really easy to think, I'm okay. I'm in. And you know that if God were to ask the question, well, as if he was standing there waiting for you, why should I let you in? Why should I let you into heaven? You, you could probably give him the right answer. So you, you assume that's all it takes. But until you're willing to jump out of the plane, it's just talk. It's just talk. Empty and useless. It's dead. Until you're willing to really submit to and surrender in truth uh, and in brokenness say, hey, I need this. This was for me. Jesus died to be my Savior and my Lord, and then it flows out of your life, and there becomes fruit. Again, because you, you start to like talking about God. You start to like talking about Jesus. You want to spend time with Him more than just once a week. And there's evidence that there's work happening in your life, that there's a change. Until then, your faith, it may not be real. One of the very obvious steps, and I can, I, I've got a few people in my mind, but they're just, again, thinking about, <laughs> I, I'm doing what I said not to do. <laughs> but, but one of the obvious steps is, is, is just being obedient in baptism, public baptism. For many of you guys, you, you, you say you trust in Christ. Maybe you've, you've, you, you're doing that right now. You're doing that today for the first time, or you're doing it, you did it 20 years ago. But if you've never taken that step of publicly being baptized and publicly declaring, I believe this, I believe in Jesus, he died for me, and I want the world to know that maybe that's your next step. That's a very easy thing to do. Again, it's a commandment. He's, Jesus tells us to be baptized, but it's a very easy first step of just giving an outward display, a first work, a fruit of your faith. It's a very important step to take. And if you haven't been baptized, I want you, and you want, maybe you want to know more about it. I don't know if anybody here in the room or you're watching, if you haven't been baptized and you want to know more about it, just send me a message or hang out this morning and talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about what baptism is, and I'd love to schedule it and make sure that it happens. But it's a very easy step, and it's a necessary step. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you've never done that, I encourage you to take that step. For the rest of us, again, just examine your heart. Really, what is it in my life that, that, that is, or, or, or the fruit of my life, what is it revealing? Is it revealing that I'm my own master or that I'm in love with Jesus? We all have fruit in our life, so just check it. What is your fruit? What are, what are your works? What are your actions revealing about you? So you know the facts. I get it. I get Christmas. I get Easter. I give intellectual, mental assent to all that. But there's no evidence in my life that I really believe it. Ask yourself this question. Have I ever really surrendered my life to that truth? I mean, I can sit on the plane all day long, go up, fly around. I, I, I can help open the door. I can pat people on the back as they jump out. But as long as I'm never willing to jump out myself, to trust the instructor, to trust the parachute, to trust whoever, again, whoever packed it all. Unless I'm willing to jump, it's all talk. It's all talk. Faith always produces action. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says they have faith, but there's no works? Can that faith save him? The answer is 
No way, Jose. That, I forgot, that, that's the Spanish translation. Um, you guys probably don't have that. It's absolutely not. Or the King James. No way, though. You get the point. Absolutely not. That faith without works cannot save him. The faith that saves is a faith that works. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this just reminder and opportunity to inspect our own heart. God, nothing else matters unless this is, is secure. Nothing else matters compared to this. Lord, help us settle this. Lord, then take that step of action to have the fruit in our lives that it reveals that we truly believe. Lord, it goes way beyond what we say, but it's what we do. It's how we live. It's, it, it's how we live around our family. It's how we live when we're by ourselves. Lord, help us be honest with ourselves and have the courage just to settle this, to do what's necessary. Whatever, whatever it is you're telling us and maybe we're having, we're just afraid to do it and we're, we're fighting you on it, Lord. Help us overcome to settle this right now. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this word. Again, let your spirit help us, convict us, and change us to be more like you. We love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're wrapping up for everybody who's on. Are we off? I don't know if we are. See you guys. Um, any questions here with you guys? Any questions? We're small.